Hey everybody, this is Rant Burgers. Thank you for listening on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about an incident that had been occurring over the last two months. Um, I was called by a lady named Elizabeth with a Caribbean style accent to go pick up a lady named Janice. Now I'm changing Janice's name. I was called to go pick up Janice over on Baldwin Avenue. Now I got to Janice's house and she said I didn't call a cab. And she was acting really tense and sort of paranoid. That's not terribly unusual. Sadly, uh, the taxi cabs here in Spokane have a bad reputation sometimes. And so, as a cab driver who likes to actually give good customer service, sometimes I have to push through a little bit of uh, fear and uncertainty on the part of my customers. But this was a little more than average. Um, so I called Elizabeth back and said, uh, she said she didn't call a cab. And Elizabeth said, let me talk to her. And uh, that was a very bad Caribbean accent. Um, but believe me, Elizabeth's accent was Caribbean. So I handed the phone over to the lady and the lady talked for a few minutes and then um, she was okay with the cab ride. I took Janice to two places that day. I took her to the bank. And then about 90 minutes later, Elizabeth called me back to get Janice and take her to the post office where she mailed the package. The next day I got a call to go pick up Janice. And by then I had made friends with Janice. And so when I, was arri when I arrived, I was surprised to find Janice extremely fearful and unhappy and uh, she said that she had not called a cab. And I said, oh, okay, then I will go somewhere else. And Janice said the oddest thing to me. She said, I don't want anyone to die. Later on that afternoon, I was called to the house, to that same address on Baldwin Avenue by the police, by the Spokane police, where I was questioned. Now, I uh, had considered using the techniques I've learned about how to deal with police stops, but I was working for City Cab. It was their cab. Also, if my friend Janice was being victimized, the police suck as a security agency. They're bad at it, but they're the only ones we've got. And so... I went ahead and cooperated with the police lady and told her what I heard. Apparently, and I am guessing at this, but apparently this Elizabeth person picked up a prepaid cell phone somewhere. Uh, when she called us, she called from two different out-of-town numbers. One was in, uh, one the area code was Baltimore, Maryland. The other one was Washington, D.C., but I know from uh, buying my uh, buying a track phone from my roommate and loading that up with minutes, you can tell them that the phone is being registered anywhere. And you can register it under any name. All you have to do is go to Gmail and pick a random and create a random Gmail account. And then you could tell them that uh, the phone is being registered in the name of Bruce Wayne from Gotham. And I know this because I've done it on an AT&T Go phone back in 2008. I used to work tech support for them. So, in the underground industry, these are called burner phones. And the, and it's because you use them for a little while, and then you burn them. You get rid of them. You throw them away. And they're impossible to trace. They're impossible to track down if you are mindful enough to only use it for a few minutes and then get rid of it. Uh... I got called last month at the end of at the end of May to go back to Janice's house and when I arrived there once again she said that she had not called for a cab. I wish I had been more clear minded. I would have asked her if she, this Elizabeth person was on the phone with her again and if she was being threatened again. What I did instead was I retired to my taxi cab and I narked Elizabeth out to the cops.
I dropped a dime on her just like that. Because anybody who's going to call up and threaten an old lady across the country, tell her that she's being secretly watched by ninjas and her loved ones will die or whatever crap they're selling, screw them. And it's an interesting ethical problem because it's just talk. And these vulnerable people should have a better sense of skepticism, a better idea of how the world works, than to believe some random person calling them on from long distance, telling them that some mafia is about to kill them or their loved ones if they don't send money. But the fact of the matter is, Janice didn't do anything wrong. She just believed lies when they were told to her. And so I feel protective of Janice. She's a vulnerable person. And so when this outsider from my community is victimizing Janice, I feel really angry. And it makes me very unhappy because I know, even though the police, you know, arrived and looked all official and took very official and notes and were vaguely threatening, that they actually can't do much of anything because... Uh, even if the money, even if Janice's money was sent across the, it was sent through the U.S. Post Office, and that makes it a federal crime, the chances of tracking down some two-bit hoodlums with a track phone is next to nothing. Next to nothing. So they're telling lies. The reason why this is coming up for me again is uh, it happened again on uh, Tuesday of this week. A man with a Caribbean accent sent me up to a trailer park on Lyons Avenue. I walked up to the trailer park and I saw a, I walked up to the specific trailer he named and I saw, you could tell, it's odd, but you could tell old lady trailers. They're very clean. They have nice gardens. Everything is very carefully placed. It's, it's odd. And that's really generalizing to old ladies. And not every old lady lives like that. Not every old lady thinks like that. But when you see that, you know, I, w I was kind of looking to see if somebody was home. I knocked on the uh, door a few times. Uh, the caller, and I actually didn't get his name. I couldn't understand when he said it. as either Michael Hartson or Hart Hartson. I'm not sure. But he gave me a telephone number when I called it. It was out of service. So, Caribbean guy calls me to go pick up an old lady, and her phone's out of service, and she's not at home. I really hope that this is the sign of an old lady who threw her phone, who threw her cell phone in the trash, and was out buying a new one. But uh, I, I called the, our local Spokane. In Spokane, we have a number called Crime Check, and it's kind of a tip line, a, an alert line. You, you call, and you can leave a message for the cops. And it's not 911, so it's not an ongoing emergency line, but you can call and, leave, and alert the cops to something stupid happening. Now, mind you, calling Crime Check is a particularly useless effort. Spokane PD almost never responds to a crime check call. I've never gotten a call back from a crime check call. Um, crime check is pretty useless, but I was kind of hoping that uh, somewhere, someone somewhere has a file going on on phone fraud in, in Spokane and adds the notes to the file for whatever reason, as if that would do any good. But my question driving away from that is if we lived in Libertopia where people had their own free market security agencies, what could those security agencies do? Again, um, the, the, the prepaid cell phones that you register on their network with fake names and fake locations, that's a creature of the free market. I mean, it's, it's basically a Wild West element of the American telephone market. I like that it's there. I like that you can go down to the store and buy a track phone, register it to Bruce Wayne or Anthony Stark, and uh, then make your calls. And then after you feel like you've used it enough, remove the battery and throw it in the trash and walk away. And 
you know, uh, the chances of it actually being hooked to you in any reasonable amount of time are slim and none. My roommate's phone. I should have known. As soon as I started recording this, she'd get a call. It, you know, timing. So, um, what could a private defense company do? What could private security do that the cops couldn't do? I have no idea. Um, I think. I think they'd have a better relationship with the old ladies under their care so that the old ladies would know to that when strange people called them out of the blue and said don't tell anybody or I'll kill your loved one now put get all your money out of your bank and send it to me that the old ladies would be able to say you know what my security force will take care of that they have my back it'd be nice to think that uh, you know these people couldn't be talked out of reaching out for help even reaching out to their neighbors for a you know a reality check and how do these scamsters identify these people anyway it, it's like predators have this weird sixth sense about who's vulnerable uh, I was trying to book up on this kind of uh, extortion and fraud before I started recording this and um, what I read was one account where people uh, claim to have loved ones of the victim under arrest. And what they do is basically a cold reading. A cold reading is where you go to your mark and you say, okay, I see that you have somebody you love. Who, who, who is that that you love? And he has leading but very general questions. And what happens is it's part of human nature. If you're in a positive relationship with somebody, they kind of subconsciously want you to succeed. So they will feed you answers to your questions that then you parrot back to them and they think they don't remember that they just told you the answer. And they'll think that you know things about them, that you have psychic powers. That's how uh, cold reading works. That's how the idiot John Edwards makes lots of money scamming people. And, well... The first knee-jerk reaction is to call the people who fall for it morons. But they're not. They're just people without the defense of skeptical thinking. And uh, they, they don't even see that they're falling for a scam. So, uh, extortionist, extortion scam artist, picks up a burner phone, dials numbers at random until he finds somebody who sounds vulnerable. I don't know how. And then he basically does a cold cold reading on them to find out who they love and who's vulnerable in their life. Then tells them horrible lies about ninjas in their, in their eaves, ninjas in their rafters. Until they go and pull their money out of the bank and send it to them. It's, it's tragic. And it makes me angry. And I have no idea what to do about it. It is, um... It is peculiar. Um... As I said, the only defense I could see is on the victim's side is to let victims, let people who are vulnerable know that they can reach out for help. That even if there are ninjas in the rafters, there will be armed libertarians to confront them. Uh, that even if, you know, the people, even if the scam person on the phone says, don't tell anybody or I'll kill everybody, that it's okay to reach out to friends. You don't have to do it alone. <sighs> And that's really my big regret with Janice over on Baldwin Avenue, is that I did not remember to tell her she had a friend in me that she could reach out to for support in case something horrible was coming across her telephone. And then I would like to be able to educate her about the magic power of the telephone. Telephones have this red button right here that you can turn them off. You can hang up the call. <sighs> How sad is it that we have to educate people that yes, no, you're allowed to end the call if it gets unpleasant. You're allowed to hang up that phone. And that when these vulnerable people get told that the ninjas are lurking in the bushes and will kill their loved ones, 
they are credulous enough to believe it without thinking, wait a minute, I, I, I haven't smelled any Chinese food. I, I'm not hearing any snickers when I go outside and sing my songs. There are no ninjas in my bushes. Um, a skeptical worldview, you know, a certain amount of reality checking is kind of necessary piece of mental defense. I just wish I could help uh, some folks have more of it. Okay, now I have to think of another topic, and I'll be right back. One more thing here. Um, I hate fascists. I hate fascists for lots and lots of reasons, and if we scroll all the way from killing tens and hundreds of millions of people, all the way down through being complete assholes and taking people's taking people's property away from them and being thieves and bastards. Scroll all the way down to the end of that. And at the bottom of the list, I hate Nazis because Nazis were big. They were they were colorful. They were very distinctive. Their their look and their signage and their propaganda and their music was all designed to press the buttons of the German people of the 1930s. But the effect of that is we live in a technocratic, business-suited corporate fascism today and you can't point it out to people. Because if I say, look, uh, government, government private partnership equals fascism, you know, uh, it, whack it hut, seek heil. People say, well, there's no swastikas, there's no goose-stepping troops, there's no horse wessel song. What are you talking about? That's not fascism. And it's really crazy because um, William Gibson, in his uh, cyberpunk books, talked about how in the future the world would be driven more by appearances, substance, and that that trend would accelerate. And I think he was dead on. And by exaggerating it completely out of proportion, in his cyberpunk novels of the early 80s, he's kind of predicted where we're at now. Um, we're at a place now where scandals last for five minutes and then they go down the memory hole forever. We live in a place where everybody can tell you um, the surface qualities of a thing while nobody can tell you what it actually is. Uh, people, you know, uh, uh, completely just strip my gears there. Isn't that fun? Isn't this good? Entertain it. Entertainment. Isn't it great working with a professional? But, uh, yeah, by making fascism so cartoonish and painting it so broadly, branding it so heavily, what's happened is uh, Mussolini and Hitler have cleared the way for the Democratic, National, De Democratic Leadership Council, the Democratic National Committee, the uh, GOP National Committee. To do a kind of a, a, a corporate board fascism. There's no one guy strutting up and down sh sh shouting Sea Kyle and throwing salutes, but we have a calm, professional looking spokes bot named Obama who stands up and says, uh, This will be good for America, and then jams another fascist piece of crap up our butts. Um, and the people, most of the people who don't like Obama, most of the anti-Obama crowd are based on completely shallow surface things. Um, you know, uh, oh, he's a socialist, you know, or oh, he was born in Kenya. You know, complete crap that doesn't actually address the problem that he is a spokesmodel for a fascist system and that the fascist system wears a suit and a tie and attends boardroom meetings. It doesn't do rallies at Nuremberg. Uh, and people can't see it. And it's frustrating to me. And that's the last reason on the list why I hate the Nazis is because they painted themselves in such heavy cloud makeup that when a uh, fascist in a suit and tie shows up and speaks in a normal tone of voice, 
people can't see him for who he is. And that's frustrating to me. Okay, let's see how quickly and yet detailed I can get with this one. Um, there's this thing called the World Cup happening. Sports teams are sportsing really hard with a ball. And everybody enjoys their superior sportsing skills. People enjoy the sportsing skills enough to buy tickets to go see sporting stars sport. You know what that makes it? That makes sports an entertainment product. Uh, my friend is a musician. Uh, he gets hired by a bar. He plays in the bar. People find this sound enjoyable. They go to the bar and buy drinks. Uh, if my friend was doing a more direct relationship with his, uh, with his fans, he would set up a venue and charge tickets and say, concert held by Dennis's band, and people would buy tickets and go see him. Now, nobody forces anybody to buy tickets to an entertainment event. Nobody forces anyone to buy a, any given movie ticket, or any given concert ticket, or any given sporting events ticket. All of this is the free market in action. All of this um, is people who really want to see the sports, and the sports played at a high level of skill and competence. What I don't especially like about the World Cup or the NFL or Major League Baseball is when fascism creeps into it. When fascism creeps into it, it's when a sports team owner with a lot of money says to a community, tax your citizens to build me a better stadium or I will take my sports team elsewhere. And then the local... local uh, municipal or county government geeks for it and says hey if we tax you to build a sporting arena then that will create lots of jobs lots, there are lots of studies that show that overall this is BS over any considerable period of time outside of the construction of the actual sporting arena itself it is completely not not effective in the way they say it is but um, that doesn't mean sports is necessarily a bad thing. Some people complain that sports appeals to what's tribal in us, and I guess this is true. Uh, what makes me very sad is when sports fans get so excited, they start burning other people's property or actually injuring and killing other people. Uh, back a few years ago when the Boston Red Sox made it into the World Series. So a couple of fans got so excited they stabbed a guy and killed him. Now I like my, I like sports but I don't think they're important enough to kill anybody over and I think that's an important distinction. It's something that kinda gets lost. I wonder how much winning a sporting event we see it sometimes. There's riots in cities when a favored team either wins or narrowly loses a sports event. And I have to wonder if that's not just kind of a spark in a, in an, a flammable environment. I have to wonder if people just aren't under tension and any old thing could set them off to run around and act like Looney Tunes. I know that the World Cup has sparked massive protests in Brazil and being against it has become kind of a uh, a radical cause celeb all over the internet and I think at the point where Brazil said we're going to tax people then use the money to build a sporting venue and then we're going to abuse and injure homeless and poor people in order to make our city look prettier for the visitors for the sports events I think that's fascism. That's not actually necessarily the sport. I would like to see it so that sports team owners and sporting venue owners had to build their venues, had to build their buildings, their stadiums and auditoriums on their own money. 
because if what they say is right and it will and a sporting arena is an engine of economic growth then they could go to a large commercial bank and borrow the money to build the arena and then pay it off over a long period of time with the growing economic power that the arena provides the fact that they don't do this lets you know that it's BS the fact that they they don't keep the money in-house lets you know that something is really hinky about that um, I know people who all but swear fealty to a given sports team my cousin really likes the Redskins uh, a friend of mine uh, dotes on the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, I do not think that any one team is worth that that worth getting involved with. I tend to try to follow the Seattle Mariners because they're our local team. I used to vaguely follow the Los Angeles Dodgers, but what I like is seeing a game well played. I I like it when I hear that sound of a well hit ball. I like the way the player spins as he hits. I like the way the fielders run and catch and throw the ball. I like it when a team works together well on a football field to score points. I like seeing people do remarkable things out at the edge of human capability. So I'm not really all that worried about which color of jersey they wear. A well-hit home run is a thing of beauty. A well-pitched ball is pretty cool. A, a surprising and effective football play is fun. It doesn't to me. It doesn't matter who who executes these things, because they're all human beings. And in the end, uh, you know, at the end of a sporting event, and this is kind of why I dove back into baseball. I actually spent some time really following the Mariners back in the early 2000s. That was right after 9/11. It was a big thing. Lots of people were watching, so you feel like you're part of a community, but it's not life or death. Nobody has to die over it. And I think that's what a lot of of the appeal of sports is. It's it's a thing, and people work hard, and they make lots of money. But in the end. You know, at the end of the game, everybody goes and hits the showers and goes home, and tomorrow's another day. It's all the good parts about war and politics without any of the downside. Okay? So, today, uh, teams from various countries are running across a large grass field kicking a ball around. Um, I haven't watched enough soccer to actually develop an eye for the play but I'm sure a, a well a well played drive and and a, a and a well scored goal are just as much fun as I find the well played elements of of baseball or football or basketball to be um, there's a reason why these things are so popular there's a reason why they generate this much money and uh, I don't think it would be viable or valuable to try to get in between people and something they want. There's a huge market for the professional sports. There's a huge pull from people who want to see. I would just prefer to see a more just and more property uh, property rights respecting method of bringing the sports to market and presenting them to the customers. Just like music just like anything else, you know, you bring what the customers want to the market and you give it to them. Bada bing, bada boom. What's the problem with that? Thank you for listening to Rant Burgers today, and I will talk to you next week.